Can you say that he is a good, good father? Do you truly believe that? It's like Beth was saying, you know, um, a lot of times you're waiting for people in churches to celebrate certain days. Chris, you're going to have to stay on that with me because this thing's whacking out again. So, but uh, some people don't, didn't have a good upbringing. It comes to Father's Day, it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. You're like that jerk, you know. Why should I celebrate that? So we don't get caught up in the Father's Day celebrations, the Mother's Day celebrations. Why? They are special, yes, but they're not special to everybody. And you know, people stay home from church on these days because they don't want to go through the pain and the agony of having to sit there and think about maybe a relationship that wasn't good. But I'm going to tell you this. If you've got a relationship with God, you've got a perfect father. And that's the one that we need to focus on, right? Because people will let us down and... and um, We'll let people down. But anyway, happy Father's Day. It's good to have you here this morning. We're going to continue on the we need to talk. I think the uh, things coming from up instead of down, over the last couple weeks, it's me, I need to talk to you guys. And I started thinking about it. You know, really, maybe God is saying we need to talk. And we need to spend more time talking to him and communicating with him. We've talked about over the past few weeks, we've talked about commitment, how God desires for us to be committed to him, because he's truly committed to us, right? He showed that commitment by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. God loves you. The Father loves you more than you can imagine. And here's what he's wanting us to do, be committed to him and love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the greatest thing we could do. Then we talked about culture a couple of weeks ago how we live in a culture, but we've got to make sure that the culture is not uh, dictating who we are. It's not impacting us. It's not influencing us. We need to be influencing the culture, which leads us to today, and we're going to be talking about character. Now, some of you are characters, but that's not what we're talking about. Character has been said, it's who you are when no one is looking. Who are you when nobody's around you? Who are you? Who are you when you're sitting at home and there's no one there to look over your shoulder to see what you're looking at or what you're listening to? Or There's no one there uh, when you're driving down the road or you're at work or you're doing your taxes. Uh, no one's looking over your shoulder. Who are you? That's your true character. We can all put on a front, and we're all good at that. I can smile when I don't feel like smiling. I can tell you I'm fine when I'm not fine. I can say praise Jesus when sometimes maybe I don't feel like praising Jesus, which is sad. But character, it's who you are when you think no one is looking. But guess who's always looking? Guess who's always looking? You know, we could hide from our earthly daddies. I hid a lot from my earthly father. A lot. But you know, I can't hide anything from my heavenly father. You know what, if I would really focus on that, if I would really, truly believe that and understand that, it would change my character, wouldn't it? Because here's the problem. We talked about it a little while, a couple weeks ago. We've stopped fearing God. Well, he's a loving father. Why should we have to fear him? Because he's a just father. And he's a father who knows how to discipline his children. And he's a father who disciplines his children because he loves them so much. It's a real love. It's a genuine love. But we've got to get back to fearing God. And if we don't, our character is not going to be what God desires for it to be. You've seen the old iceberg thing. The iceberg represents you as a person, kind of. That's not, that's, I guess that's a poor representation. But um, The 10% above the water is what everyone sees. Think about this. It's the 90% below the water that represents your character, who you really are. It's the part that people can't see. And they say that it's what's below the water that sinks the ship. It's not that 10% above. It's the 90%. It's our character. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. I've I've got a lot of verses today, so I'm going to let the Scripture do most of the talking. But I really want you to In fact, let's just take a moment right now because I really sense that somebody in here needs to really open up your ears and your eyes and your heart 
to what the Spirit would say to you today. Father, we do thank you for today. We do thank you that you're not only a loving Father, you're the loving Father. You're the perfect Father. You're the one and only true God. And we thank you, Father, that we can come into your presence and that we can sing praises to you. And I pray, Lord, that our life shows worship for you. I pray that our character truly points to you. And so, Father, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our heart to receive from your word truth. And that, Lord, it might impact us, that we might leave here changed forever, more in love with you. So thank you for this time. Lord, I pray your blessings upon the words that come out of my mouth, that they'd be your words and not mine. Protect the ears from anything that I would say that's not truth from your word. We look forward to what you're going to do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, it's time for Christians to start behaving like Christians. All right? Can we get, can we get serious for a moment? It's time for Christians to start behaving like Christians, people. Because people are watching. Matthew 5, 16 Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. One of our earthly responsibilities, if you will, I don't like that word, but I, you know how my brain works. I can't think of the words I want when I want them. It's to bring glory and honor to the Father. I didn't bring, I tried to, I didn't do, I didn't do a bad job, but I didn't always bring glory and honor to my earthly dad. And I don't always bring glory and honor to my, earth, my heavenly Father, but my desire should be to be perfect in that area. We're to strive for perfection. That's what the Scripture teaches. Not being perfect people, but being spiritually mature so that our lives reflect Jesus, reflect the Father, reflect the Spirit. And Jesus says we're to let our light shine. If I am not living as a person of character, my light is not shining in the dark world. Abraham Lincoln said this, character is like a tree and reputation like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. And then in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, another one of those woes from Jesus. Again, it's not good when people would hear the woe to you from Jesus. And I don't ever want to hear a woe to you from Jesus. But he says to the, to the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious bunch, the ones who, who looked good, the 10% looked really good, but the 90% was not glorifying, glorifying God. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There's that word again. Not a good word. Don't want to be called a hypocrite, do you? Do you? Or maybe you do. Maybe, maybe you don't give a rip what anybody thinks about you. But I'm going to tell you this. You should. If you claim the name of Christ, you should care what people think about you. I should care what people think about me. It should bother me if someone thinks negatively towards me, if I've given them a reason to do so. Now, some people are just going to be that way. They're going to be negative. They're going to think you stink. They're going to think... Everything you do is wrong. But if you're trying to live for the Lord, if you're living for the Lord and you're letting your light shine and then people think negatively of you, then and that's, that's a purpose where I don't care what people think about me. There's nothing I can do. You're not going to change those minds or those hearts. But I need to still continue to live for the Lord. I don't need to lower myself to their standard. So stay off Facebook. Just a note there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. If you came over to my house and we served you a meal and we're getting ready to serve you a meal and we put your cup down in front of you and it's all nice and sparkly and clean on the outside, but inside it's all crusty and got things growing in it and stuff. Probably not going to want to drink out of it, are you? 
put a dish down before you and it's all beautiful and white and porcelain or whatever they make it out of and it looks really beautiful and we sit it down in front of you and when we do you see fungus growing in the bottom of it you're going to be saying like I say Alice you need to do a better job washing dishes (laughs) this is what Jesus is comparing the religious bunch to a bunch of glasses a bunch of dishes that are clean on the outside but on the inside It's full of just junk. It's full of greed. It's full of self-indulgence. You don't want Jesus calling you a hypocrite, people. You don't. Do you? No. If I don't want Jesus calling me a hypocrite, guess what I need to do? I live a life for him. Let my light shine so that others can see my good works, which, which points to and brings glory to the Father. Jesus gets down to the character part here talks about being a hypocrite, and it's not a good thing. Hi- hypocrisy is like leaven. Again, I'm going to be talking about something I know nothing about, baking. But you put leaven, you put yeast in the bread, right, to make it rise and to make it puff up. Make it puff up. See, leaven puffs things up, right? In the Bible, many, most of the time, leaven is uh, equated to sin. And hypocrisy is like leaven in the sense that it only takes a little bit of it to affect a great mass. It only takes a little bit of leaven. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It makes the whole thing puff up. A little bit of hypocrisy can be like a little bit of strychnine. Yeah, put a little bit of strychnine in your coffee every morning. It can be destructive or even deadly, right? Jesus doesn't want us to have leaven in our life. Do you realize this, this, that hypocrisy is one of the main reasons non-believers don't want to attend church? It's one of the main reasons. I think more people would want to attend if they saw something genuine from us. Several years ago, a poll was, was taken and showed that the lifestyle activities of Christians were statistically the same as those of people claiming not to be Christians when it comes to the following list. This is not my list, and I'm not pin, picking out whatever you do or don't do, okay? So just go along with the poll. But when it comes to the following list, it's saying that Christians were, their lifestyles didn't show any difference than the non-Christians. Gambling, visiting pornogra- pornographic websites, taking something that didn't belong to them, saying mean things behind someone's back, consulting a medium or a, physic, or a psychic, physic, a psychic, Having a physical fight or abusing someone, using illegal or non-prescription drugs, lying, getting back at someone for something they did, and consuming enough alcohol to be considered legally drunk. There was no statistical difference between a Christian and non-Christian in these 10 areas of, of people's life. The only activity that was less common for Christians than for non-Christians, and this is not a joke, was recycling. Only 68% of Christians recycle and 79% of non-Christians do. This exemplifies what people mean when they say Christians are hypocrites. Listen to me. I'm not picking at you. I'm not pointing at you. I have to point to me too. But we should not be, as children of God, seen as hypocrites in the world. Should we? Now, now, wake up and talk with me. Should we? In two weeks, we're going to talk about this grace thing. Love grace, believe in grace, thankful for grace. But we're going to talk about this grace thing, thing, what it is and what it's not. We're going to talk about causing people to stumble with our lives and with our lifestyles. So I want you to be here. You're like, yeah, I really want to be here for that one. No, I really do. I really want you to be here. But this should bother us that we look, statistically, we look no different than non-Christians. It should bother us. But what we do is we come into our little, our little groups every Sunday morning, our little packs, our little sect, S-E-C-T-S, uh, and, and we think everything's fine. And it's easy to smile at one another out here. It's easy to shake hands. It's easy to say, God bless you. It's easy to say, whatever. The real deal is when we walk out there. What do people see in you at work? What do people hear from you at work? 
What do people see and hear from you? Oh, I don't know, when you're sitting, ladies, getting your hair done or your nails done or whatever. What's the latest juice? Remember, I told you a few months ago, I've, I've, I've realized I've got the gift of meddling. So I'm meddling right now. When you're on Facebook, you do realize a lot of people can see what you write on Facebook, right? Have you figured that one out yet? You think you're saying something to somebody, and if you don't go down in that messenger tab and make it personal, we get to read it. It amazes me to see some of the things, not you, some of the things that professing Christians put on Facebook. It blows my mind. You say, well, I mean, you say, don't be hiding it. Don't be that 90% in the dark. So we'll just put her out there. <laughs> yeah, put her out there. And then tell them how much Jesus loves them. Non-Christians see people who claim to be morally upright, yet look, sound, act, and live no differently than anyone else in the world. Should not be. According to the Bible, though, if there is no outward change in behavior, allegiances, loves, and passions, Jesus would question whether these people are actually Christians at all. People saying a prayer is not going to get you into heaven. We have to repent. We have to change, have a ch mindset change. We have to truly confess our sins before God, and we have to truly receive the gift of salvation that Jesus has already paid for. But when you do, your life will change immediately. And then sanctification starts, and it's a process that between here and eternity, we should be growing more and more and more and more and more like Christ. Striving to be perfect, spiritually mature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, he's a brand new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And if my life hasn't didn't change, and it didn't the first time I prayed that prayer. In fact, I became worse. There was no Jesus. That prayer was not going to save me from hell. It's surrendering my heart and receiving, believing in Jesus as Lord, and trusting him as my Savior, confessing my sins, and turning to him, realizing I'm not going to be perfect on this earth, but I want to desire to be because I want to desire to glorify and honor my Father. That's how we, as children of God, professing Christians, ought to be living. The problem is, though, our lives misrepresent Christianity to the world. Ask yourself this question. Why would anybody want what you've got when it comes to spiritual matters? Well, I'm going to heaven. Are you? Do you know for sure? Luke chapter 12, we're going to get into the scripture now. I told you I was going to do that a long time ago. We're going to get into the scripture now, and we're going to, we're going to go through it. The scripture does not need my interpretation, even though I'll throw a point here and there. But listen to the scripture. It's the word of God. Pray right now. God, open up my ears to what you want to say to me. You can stick your fingers in your ears and say, I don't want to hear it. That's not a good thing. Our desire should be, Lord, I want to know what you want from me, and that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he, Jesus, began to say to his disciples first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We talked about that. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. Or hidden that will not be known. I don't have time to go into it. Numbers, Moses, Reuben and Gad, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel. I guess I'm going into it. The 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> Moses wanted them all to go on the west side of the Jordan and, and claim the promised land. Because he knew there was going to be great battles. Reuben and Gad said, no, we want to stay on the east side. It's better for our herds and it's better for our families. And Moses said, I'm not pleased with that. And they said, but we will go fight. We will leave our women and children here, and we will go fight with you to take the promised land. And here's what Moses told them. He said, okay, not the greatest plan, but okay, you say you're going to. You better do what you say. And then here's where the phrase comes in. It's in Numbers, I believe. He said this, if you don't, if you don't, be sure your sin will find you out. 
That's where we get that saying. The word of God. Be sure your sin will find you out. Nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. You won't get away with it. But here's the thing. If your pastor never finds out about it, if your mommy and your daddy never find out about it, God still knows. You should fear your heavenly father more than you fear what Mickey knows. Because I'll get up here and say something about it. From the rooftop. No, I won't go there. You should care more of what God thinks than your neighbor. You should care more of what God thinks than your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whoever, whomever. But we've stopped truly caring what God thinks because we've allowed this thing to come in that says, oh, you said a prayer, act however you want to act. You know, God's grace covers it. God, your sins are all covered. I'm going to tell you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. It's the word of God. If you find anywhere in the word of God that says, because I'm a Christian, I can go do what I want to do, and it's covered, I challenge you to show me that. I can show you all throughout scripture where it says, I don't want you doing that. If you do that, there's going to be repercussions. I love you enough that I'm going to discipline you if you get out of line. I want you to bring glory and honor to me. I want your life to reflect me. I want your light to shine so that others see good works in you. Because why? They point to the Father. So be careful what you listen to. If it's not the word of God and somebody's proclaiming it to be the word of God, they're false prophets. They're false teachers. The Bible says in the last days, they're going to be running rampant. They're everywhere. They're some of your favorite TV pastors. And there's many of us standing in the pulpit, many of them standing in the pulpit today. That's why it's important you know the word of God. So you know when truth is being told to you. Luke chapter 6, verse 43 for no tree, no good tree bears bad fruit. Catch this. You should be a good tree. No good tree bears bad fruit. Doesn't mean you're not going to have a worm and an apple every now and then. Right? But the fruit of the tree is good. Doesn't mean one's not going to maybe be a little less delicious or whatever. It may have some deformities on it or whatever. But a good tree bears good fruit. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor, does, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. What are you known by when people see you out there? For figs are not gathered from thorn bush, bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. Figs are gathered from what? Fig tree. The good person out of the good treasure of, of the heart produces good fruit produces good and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks the true character comes out and then jesus says this why do you call me lord lord and not do what i tell you do you hear it jesus says why do you call me lord and we go out there and we call him lord but people are seeing that we're not living according to what he's telling us and so they're confused i don't get it you say he's lord he's savior He's this, he's that, he's other, and you're living like that? I don't get it. To produce good fruit with your life, you must be good at the root, at the heart. I hate to have to keep qualifying statements that I make. God understands we're going to mess up. But if I just live a life of mess ups because I don't give a rip, then I have to ask myself, am I truly his? Yes, his grace is sufficient, and his grace covers my sin, but his grace doesn't give me a license to sin. I can back my statement up. Can you back whatever you're thinking of? So open our eyes and our hearts to the word of God. Let's go through this quickly, okay, quickly. 
My favorite? A few verses. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus has, have crucified, catch this, they've put to death, they've nailed it to a tree, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. With the Spirit in control, you will be a person of great character. Because with the Spirit in control, you're going to be exhibiting love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And if you're not exhibiting those things to the world, then you're not walking in the Spirit. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian, don't get me wrong, but you're not walking in the Spirit and the Spirit does not have total control of you. Philippians 4, verse 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, truth, better there, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any, any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you put your mind on these things, your character will be a godly character. And people will have no reason to call you a hypocrite. What you have learned and received and heard, Paul says, and seen in me. He's setting the example, and he has already said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And that's what we should be able to say to people. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, the example given for me uh, by the word, the example given for me through his spirit, the example given for me through living for him and seeing it out in others, live it out in others. What you have heard, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And look at the promise. And the God of peace will be with you. Some of your household needs to start practicing these things. Some of you parents need to stop looking like hypocrites in front of your children. You're bringing them to church, not you. I'm talking to people in other churches. You're bringing them to church. But at home, they're seeing something different than what they're hearing in church. It confuses kids. As they grow up, they need to see mom and dad or mom or dad, whatever the situation is. They need to see whoever's in charge living a life that points to God. Then you're training up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they will not depart. What does, what does that mean? When they're old, they know where to come back to. But if you don't train them up in the way they should go, guess what? The world's going to train them. Does it matter? This is real serious. Does it matter to you whether your children go to hell or not? Does it matter to you whether your neighbors go to hell or not? Does it matter to you whether your boss goes to hell or not? Then stop living like hell in front of them. I'm saying that with a smile because that's pretty mean. But I'm not apologizing. And I'm talking to me too. 2 Peter 1.5. You said, boy, this is a great Father's Day message. <laughs> We're talking about the Father that matters more than anything. And every day should be Father's Day. Because our lives should point to the Father. Every day. 2 Peter 1, 5, for this very reason, make every effort, make every effort. It's an effort. Paul said things like this, I learned in everything how to be content. And Peter, Peter's saying, for this very reason, make every effort. And if, for what very reason? If you read before it, it talks about the goodness, the kindness, the mercies, everything that God has done for us. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue is one of those, excuse me, words I know, but I still have to look it up every time I read it. You have words like that? You read scripture and you read it for 100 years and you still have to look it up and put it in place? Virtue means this, behavior showing high moral standards. Shouldn't Christians have a behavior that shows high moral standards? Shouldn't we? Supplement our faith with that kind of behavior. And then supplement virtue with knowledge. We need to know more about God's word and the knowledge of God. And knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness. Don't quit, and steadfastness with godliness. That should be who we are. That should be what we are. And godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. 
For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These things need to be increasing so that we can be effective in our knowledge of the Lord. Because when we're effective in our knowledge of the Lord, then we're showing Jesus to other people. And you know, you won't be a hypocrite. And your character will be godly character. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted. This is God's word speaking, not me. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. She is blind. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Have you forgotten? Remind yourself right now, I have been saved and set free from my former sins. Remind yourself of that. And that should make us say, praise you, Jesus. I'm about to get pumped up up here. Can't you tell? You're done. Colossians 3.12. I am almost done. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You see, the world's watching, right? When we put these things on, the world sees something different. You know, what? this just popped in. It may, I don't even know where I'm going with this. But it just, I've got to say this. I don't, uh, I'm trying to think what I'm supposed to say now as I'm saying it. When the team went on the mission trip to Haiti a couple weeks ago, when they went in there, hopefully all 100% of them showing was all about Jesus. But here's what the people saw when they went in. I, I'm guessing, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. But they saw compassionate hearts when they saw you guys. They saw kindness. They saw humility. They saw meekness. What is meekness? Meekness is simply power under control. They saw patience, probably. How easy it is to go to another country and show all those things, but we have trouble showing them in our backyard. We have trouble showing them in our home. Bearing with one another. And if one, catch this, if one has a complaint against another, you bear with them. And you forgive them. Well, they didn't ask me to. Doesn't matter. He can set you free. Forgive them. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also, what's the word there? Must. Must. It's not a good thought. It's not uh, Jesus asking us to do something through his word. You must forgive. When I see the word must, I'm thinking, I think think I'm supposed to do this. And above all, these put on love. Which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love is so important. God is love. When God's in control of your life, then love flows through you. When the Holy Spirit is in control, love, joy, peace, patience, all these things flow through you. And I say this all the time. Your fruit is not for you. Your fruit is not for you to look good. The fruit on you from the Holy Spirit is so that others can taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? And that's what we're supposed to be. Fruit trees. Fruity. Start calling you guys an orchard. That's what we need to be. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let, catch this, I love this. Some of you need to just get this verse right here. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Some of you need to let his peace rule in your heart. To which indeed you were called in one body. And be what? Thankful. Thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs 
with thankfulness in your hearts to God, we should be a little bit more joyful than what we are. You know what? I know a lot of you have got my personality and you're not bubbly. We all look like sticks in the mud. But we ought to be joyful. We ought to be singing praises. We ought to be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. What have you got to be thankful for? Say it. Yeah. Does the world see that in us? Or do we look just like them? In verse 17, and whatever you do. What does the word whatever mean? We have this test all the time. What does the word whatever mean? Those of you who are sleeping, you know who you are. Get your head up. Somebody asked me the other day, do you really see people sleeping? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, coming to church and just letting everything go in one ear and out, ear and out the other or taking a nap or siesta or staying in the bathroom or whatever doesn't get you a gold star on your refrigerator from Father. He expects a little bit more than that. So I want to encourage you, listen to this word, whatever you do, in word or deed, whatever you do, the word whatever means what? Whatever. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. What does everything mean? Everything. It means everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And give thanks. And you won't look like a hypocrite out there. You may look like a freak. Hey, Jesus freak, freak, Jesus. Uh, no, that's a different song. That's a, some other freak. That's a secular song there I sing. We should look different out there. It's time we stopped looking like the world. And start looking like whatever it looks like to, to be a Jesus follower. I'm not saying... Do your hair a certain way and sit with your legs crossed and sit and pass out flowers and stuff. I'm just saying, go live it. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. And then we're done right here, I think. Yep. I have one more point after this, but we're done right here. And this is going to carry over in a couple of weeks. So I just want to hit it quickly. Paul's talking to the Corinthian Christians here. And they're focused on their own rights. They're focused on their own self. Not caring about what others thought or saw in them. That's a very dangerous place to be for a Christian. Paul says this, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. I think he hit on this recently. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And here's what we've done with grace. And again, I don't have time to go to it, but two weeks, come back. Come back next week. In two weeks, I'm going to talk about this. <laughs> We've taken grace and said, all things are lawful so I can do what I want to do. No. It's not true. And we'll see that. So these Christians, Corinthian Christians, thought, uh, you know, they focused on their own, self, their, own, their own selves. And they didn't care what others thought or saw. And they, as we today, were asking the wrong question. I've done whole messages on this. We've got to learn how to ask the right question. The wrong question is this, what's wrong with it? That's the wrong question to ask about anything. Somebody points out, your pastor says something, you say, well, what's wrong with it? That's the wrong question to ask. The correct question to ask is, what's right about it? You're getting ready to do something, somebody comes up to me and says, Mickey, I don't think you, I don't think you should whatever, whatever, whatever. I shouldn't say, well, what's wrong with it? I need to stop and think, you know, okay, what, what is right about it? And if I can't give them what's right about it, I don't need to be doing it. And that's what the Corinthians were, churches were, do, were doing. They were living, they were having divisiveness, they were arguing, they were fighting, they were doing all these things, but they, they were saying, well, what's wrong with it? You know, grace covers everything. What's wrong with it? It's the wrong question. You jump down to verse 31, it says this, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. Now, you put that in context, and we're talking about meats offered to idols, and that's going to be in our message in a couple of weeks. Uh, what can we do? What can't we do? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? And we'll talk about that. But, but go down to verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. Quiz, what does the word whatever mean? Whatever. Yeah, you're getting it. Whatever you do, 
do all to the what? Glory. Glory of God. If we will learn to do whatever we do, you're not going to be perfect, but that's not an excuse not to do it or to attempt it. Because God will give you the, the power, the ability. He's given you the Holy Spirit within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you have the power of God living within you so you can accomplish anything that God's word tells you to do. Do you get that? So whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You can do it. And he's not talking about complaining to the glory of God. He's not talking about getting on Facebook and cutting somebody down to the glory of God. He's talking about what you're doing brings glory to God. And our character and our lifestyle should reflect the Lord. So just because something is permitted does not mean that it's beneficial. And here's my last point, and then I am done. Beth, you can make your way up here. The purpose of our lives isn't to see how much we can get away with and still be Christians. Rather, it's to glorify God. Now, now chew on that for a moment. The purpose of our lives isn't to see how much we can get away with and still be Christians. You get that? It's to glorify God. Let's bow our heads. I've got a couple questions for you and a couple of statements, and I want you to think about this. Question number one, are you a child of God? Are you? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I didn't ask you if you joined a church. I didn't ask you if you belonged to a certain denomination. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. I didn't ask you if you've been sprinkled. I didn't ask you if you've gone through classes. I asked you if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Have you accepted the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and the only way to heaven is through Jesus? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? It's about a love relationship. It's not about a, an obligation. It's not about a, a, a denomination. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship, a love relationship with the creator of the universe. The only way to get to the Father is through the Son. Have you trusted Jesus? He paid the price for your sins. He hung on the cross. So my question to you is, are you a child of God? If the answer is yes, then it's time to start acting like it. Because your heavenly Father deserves it. After all he's done for us, after all he gave for us, he deserves for us to act like children of the one true living God. Are you truly saved? Are you? Or have you been playing games? Are you truly saved? then live it. The world needs to see it. The world needs to see real, born-again, Bible-believing, Jesus-following children of God. The world's a dirty place. The world's a nasty place. The world's an evil place. The world's a dark place. And we need to let our light shine. So that our good works will point to the Father. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, right where you sit, you can call upon him. If you need us to pray with you, we will. We'd be happy to. But here's what you do. Do you believe in Jesus? If the answer is yes. It doesn't mean you have to know everything about him because you, many of you won't know much about him if you've never trusted him as Savior. But do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe with as much faith as you can muster up that he died on a cross? And then on the third day, he got up and walked out of the tomb, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Do you believe that? Then the Bible tells us to confess that. We believe that. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart. It's, it's more than a head knowledge. It's believing with every ounce of yourself. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved pretty simple but it's very 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 complex Jesus has already paid the price for your sin but you've got to accept it so you can call upon him right now but my main focus is on the rest of us who call ourselves Christians 
I don't know if you noticed or not, but my message was about we need to start living it. What is it that's in your life that's keeping you from reflecting Jesus to the world? That needs to go. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will go if you'll turn it loose. And tell the Lord you want to live for him. I don't know that I've ever done this, but I'm going to ask us to pray together. I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Now help me today, Lord, to live for you, to honor you, to serve you. Jesus name amen now see I don't know if you you may be like me I don't like somebody telling me what to pray <laughs> some of you may have turned me off right there because we kept getting lower and lower and lower I get that I totally get that I don't like for somebody to tell me to raise my hands I don't like for somebody to tell me to clap But you know, sometimes we got to step outside of what we like and don't like and do what's best to bring glory and honor to God.